Hi everyone, so I touched on senescence in the previous ageing tutorial, uh, but the field of senescence is actually quite large, so I wanted to dedicate a whole tutorial to explaining this in more detail. So the term senescence was first described in 1961 by two scientists called Hayflick and Moorhead, and basically they discovered that fibroblasts have a finite proliferative capacity when cultured. And by this I mean that after a certain amount of time, the cells in culture would just stop dividing. So cell division is really important because it helps our body to generate more cells in order to replenish any damaged or dead cells. So the reason for this sudden cell cycle arrest wasn't discovered until uh, 1970. And this was discovered to be due to telomere dysfunction. And this type of senescence is known as replicative senescence. So for a cell to divide, it must first make a new copy of all the genetic material which is stored in the chromosomes. The end regions of our chromosomes are known as telomeres. Um, and these are regions of non-coding TTAGGG repeats, and they act as a kind of protective cap at the end of the chromosome. So because human chromosomes are linear, uh, they therefore have ends, and the very end of the chromosome cannot be fully copied in each round of replication. And this is known as the end replication problem. So to explain this, I'm going to have to go back to basics a little bit and explain how DNA replication works. So as I mentioned before, uh, human DNA is linear. And one of the other problems we have is that DNA polymerase can only make DNA in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction. But because DNA contains two strands, one that runs 5' prime to 3' prime, and then another that runs in the opposite direction, so 3' prime to 5', prime, this means that the replication of these two strands has to occur differently. So the new strand that runs 5' prime to 3' prime towards the replication fork is made in a continuous manner, and this is called the leading strand. So the other strand which runs away from the fork is a bit trickier. So instead the strand is produced in smaller pieces. And these are known as the Akasaki fragments. So each of the fragments starts with its own RNA primer and then is known as the lagging strand. So the primers of the fragments are easily replaced with DNA and this will eventually leave the DNA strand unbroken. However, when you get to the replication fork, at the end of the chromosome, a short stretch of DNA does not get covered by one of these fragments. And this is because there's just no way to get the fragment started, because the primers would fall beyond the end of the chromosome. So each time a cell divides, we have around 50 to 200 base pairs that get lost from the telomeres. So to prevent our cells from eating into any important encoding DNA, when telomeres become critically short, our cells are able to sense this and they initiate what's known as a DNA damage response. And this basically tells the cells to stop dividing and to become senescent. So during normal cell cycle progression, a cycle-independent kinase complex phosphorylates the retinoblastoma protein. And this phosphorylation allows the retinoblastoma protein to dissociate from the transcription factor E2F. So this then allows E2F to initiate the expression of loads of downstream genes which encode products that are necessary for cell cycle progression. However, during senescence, DNA damage proteins are able to detect DNA damage, and this then results in the activation of the tumor suppressor protein P53. So P53 activation leads to the upregulation of P21, which leads to the inhibition of the cycle-independent kinase complex, and that ultimately leads to cell cycle arrest. There's also another P16 pathway, which is also linked to senescence, and this often acts as a second barrier to prevent growth in cells which have really severely dysfunctional telomeres or DNA damage. So as well as replicative senescence, which occurs when cells reach their proliferative capacity, which is known as the Hayflick limit, senescence can also be induced by a variety of different stimuli without the presence of any detectable telomere erosion. So in this case, the type of senescence is known as premature senescence rather than replicative senescence because they've not yet reached this Hayflick limit where the telomeres are critically short. So I've already mentioned that other types of DNA damage that is non-telomeric can induce senescence. This would be things like single-stranded or double-stranded DNA breaks. And this would likely be induced through the DNA damage response in a similar manner to telomere erosion. However, other cellular stresses can also give rise to senescence if they continue for a prolonged period of time. So stress-induced senescence would be due to things like hypoxia, which is a state defined by the reduction or lack of oxygen, or it could be induced by an increase in reactive oxygen species, or ROS. So ROS are chemically reactive species of oxygen, 
However, their levels have to be really carefully maintained because an increase in ROS can lead to oxidative stress. And this is things such as superoxide, peroxide or single oxygen. And biologically, these are formed as a natural byproduct of normal metabolism. And this kind of stress can cause senescence through the MAP kinase protein P38, which then also goes on to activate the P51, P21 pathway. Interestingly, in contrast to the traditional view that oncogenes promote uncontrolled proliferation in cancer, oncogenes have also been found to be potent inducers of senescence. So this initial discovery came when an oncogenic form of the oncogene RAS was expressed in fibroblasts, and it gave a phenotype that was really similar to fibroblasts that have undergone replicative senescence. And since then, the list of oncogenes has risen to around over 50. Okay, so now that I've explained more about the different types of stimuli and the mechanisms behind how cells become senescent, I thought I would explain a bit more about the senescent phenotype. So essentially, this means what they look like and how they behave and what the consequences of them are. So senescent cells tend to be flat and enlarged in size. Um, they also secrete a complex pool of proteins such as pro-inflammatory cytokines, chemokines, growth factors and proteases. And collectively, these are known as the senescence associated secretory phenotype or the SASP for short. And one of the key features of the SASP is to attract immune cells, which should in turn then orchestrate the clearance of senescent cells. However, SASP proteins are highly pleiotrophic, which means that they have multiple functions and can therefore impact a number of different biological processes. For example, the SASP is able to reinforce senescence in both a cell autonomous manner, as well as transmit senescence to neighbouring cells in a paracrine manner. And the response of neighbouring cells really depends on the cell type and the context. For example, as well as paracrine senescence, the SASP can also stimulate angiogenesis. And this is the formation of new blood vessels. It can increase proliferation of nearby epithelial cells and therefore promote tumorigenesis. And it can also promote the invasion of neoplastic cells and disrupt normal tissue structure and function. So although senescence has traditionally been viewed as a protective anti-cancer mechanism, which is of course important, it's also evident that these cells can also be damaging. And as I explained in the previous tutorial on ageing, the accumulation of senescent cells as we age can become very detrimental and lead not only to ageing but also to some age-related diseases. So I'm going to spend the next tutorial introducing the topic of senescence in the immune system, which is known as immunosenescence. So as always, if you enjoyed this tutorial and want to find out more, then please make sure you subscribe and keep an eye out for the next one. Thank you.